Welcome to the latest episode of the Informing Choices mini-pod. The duration of human life, longevity, is influenced by genetics, the environment, and our lifestyles. Environmental improvements beginning in the 1900s extended the average lifespan dramatically, with significant improvements in the availability of food, clean water, better living conditions, reduced exposure to infectious disease, and access to medical care. The study of longevity genes is a developing science. It's estimated that about 25% of the variation in human lifespan is determined by genetics, but which genes and how they contribute to longevity are not well understood yet. Once they are understood, might we see the death of death? To talk about this issue, I'm delighted to welcome director of the Millennium Project, futurist, transhumanist, and author Jose Cordero back to the podcast. Jose, welcome back. This is a fascinating topic and one that many people will feel quite conflicted by, isn't it? Well, I don't know if people will be having a conflict, but I think they will have a lot of fun living longer, healthier, um, wealthier lives. I, I, I'm always so happy to hear your positivity around this uh, around this topic and i'm sure that will that will come through our next uh, 15 minutes or so while we're together but but let me start with this as i understand it the ba basic premise here is that we should be treating aging as a disease and consider it curable is that how you see it uh, yes of course we have many diseases that we have been uh, conquering or curing throughout the ages, but now we are discovering that aging itself is at the center of most diseases. And so if we can cure aging, if we can stop aging, if we can reverse aging, we will basically stop Alzheimer's, cancers, heart trouble, and many other conditions that only appear when you get old. I mean, to some extent, it, it, it seems like this is kind of a societal mindset because we've kind of been hacking our ageing for years, haven't we? Uh, yes, well, we always wanted to live uh, longer, of course. But now, for the first time, we have the scientific possibility not only of living longer, but even reversing aging, which is the objective, reversing aging, because we don't want to be indefinitely old. We would like to be indefinitely young. Yeah, yeah we certainly would. And I mean, I'm glad you kind of brought up that difference because the next thing I was going to ask is, is you know, just drill down a little bit more for us in, in the difference between stopping aging and rejuvenation, if you like, because they're two quite different things, really. And perhaps some of these technologies we might talk about presently take us a little bit more towards regeneration or rejuvenation from uh, just kind of slowing down the aging process, don't they? Uh, yes, of course. Well, throughout history, uh, we have been increasing the uh, average life spans. Uh, at the time of the Roman Empire, average lifespan was about 20, 25 years of age. At the year 1900, we were reaching 40 years of age. Today, we are going over 80 years for average life expectancy at time of birth. And this continues increasing. But also uh, now in modern times, not only do we live longer, but we live healthier lives. That is to, to put it in a comparative way. A person who is 80 years old today is much healthier than a person that was 80 years old in the year 1900 or even at the time of the Roman Empire. Mm. Because indeed there were people who reached age, age 80 in the Roman Empire. They were very few, very, very few people lived that long. But those people were really aged in today's terms. So today's older people are much healthier. But uh, in the future, the objective is not only to keep on living longer, even healthier when you are 80 or 100 and 120. The objective is to rejuvenate people so that when we become 100 in 20 years, we will have the biological age of someone 30 years of age, for example. 
So just going back to something you said about, you know, even if we look back in history, there were people that even today we would consider aged. How much of the ability of someone to live to older years in the past, was that a factor of their social status, of their wealth? Well, of course, that was important. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, if you had more resources, uh, even today, uh, you have a longer life expectancy. Uh, on average, of course, there are always exceptions. But yes, uh, you had to have a lot of money uh, to live uh, longer in the past. But also, uh, you have to take care of yourself because if you happen to be a slave in the Roman Empire, or if you had to go to a war, which was very common. You know, wars were common in antiquity, in the ancient times. There were wars every day, continuously, all the time. Now it's just the opposite. Now we have peace most of the time. And when there is a war, there is an outcry, which I think is fantastic. And actually, there should be no wars in the future, not at all. But uh, anyway, going back to your question, uh, yes, people... Um, living today longer in better shape but you need also less money today less money than compared to in the past typically i i guess when we start to think about an aging population rejuvenating the population you know typically there might be fears around overpopulation the lack of funding um, for aging populations pensions and so forth but what might the consequences be if we're able to stop and reverse aging because it's just it's not just about therefore having an increasing population of people unable to be physically active is it uh, if we cure aging we are going to have young healthy people they will not need all the money that today we use in social security and medical therapies at the end of age in fact uh, the, today we, we live in a tragedy about 80% of the medical expenditures are uh, used in the final five years of a person's lifetime. And even then they die. I mean, how horrible, 80% of the medical cost and then people still die. The objective is that uh, money will be used in the beginning so that people do not age. And if you do not age, then you will not have heart trouble, you will not have Alzheimer's, you will not have cancer and so on and so forth. So actually people are talking about a longevity dividend. Living longer, healthier lives will actually not only save money, but will actually be productive for the economy. Because if you are young and healthy, you can produce. Instead of uh, living out of pensions, you will be able to produce and do the things that you want to do. So, so how, how, what kind of role does technology and the convergence of different technologies play in the, this idea of, of the death of death? What, what role do we have for what sort of technologies? Well, uh, technology is what makes us different uh, from animals. We are basically technological animals, and we use technology always to improve the human condition. Now we can use technology to stop aging, to cure aging, and to reverse aging. And this is unique in this time in history, because we didn't have so much technology even 50 years ago. Uh, in fact, even 20 years ago. The year uh, 2012 was a very important year, I think, in terms of um, rejuvenation technologies because the Nobel Prize in medicine that year was given to a scientist called Shinja Yamanaka who discovered that there are four genes that control the aging process. This would have been science fiction even 20 years ago that there were some genes that control the aging process at least uh, the way it was discovered in the skin of mice, in the cells of the skin of mice. But now this has been generalized uh, with other mammalians. And also in our case for humans, we have a few genes that control aging and we can change the status of those, those genes, put them on and off so that we are actually young instead of old. And, and this is incredible, so incredible that there are billions of dollars being invested in this new technology that I repeat, was unknown two decades ago. Mm. 
I, I, lo I love this idea of the kind of this science fiction and magic that some of these technologies might seem really clashing with the idea of technology possible. Uh, and, and we're at a really interesting tipping point, are we? Not for just these, but all sorts of technologies where in the past we might have said, can technology do this for us? Increasingly, we're able to ask, should we let technology do this for us? It's just a, such a different world than ever we've seen before, isn't it? Yes. And actually, uh, talking about magic and uh, science fiction, I went all the way to Colombo, Sri Lanka, to interview Sir Arthur C. Clarke uh, before he died. And he was a real visionary. And as you know, he wrote the three laws of the future. And his third law of the future is any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And so we are really talking about magic, some technology is that same magical, even to us only 20 years ago. And let me tell you, because uh, to me also, to so many people, this is magical. And um, why? Because the human genome is the same, actually is the same throughout your life. So if the human genome is the same, why can you be young at some time? You can be adult and then you can be old with the same genome. And that is why some genes were discovered that are on or off at different times in life. And this is called epigenetic, which is really beyond genetics. Genetics is there, but then there is epigenetics, the genetics above the genes, that you can switch genes on and off. And one more thing that to me also was science fiction 20 years ago, because scientists discovered that they can change one skin cell into a neuron or a heart cell or a muscle cell. And people would say, how is it possible? How can a neuron become a heart cell? And actually, it is very simple. They all have the same genome. And if you twitch that genome, if you change some genes on and off, you can change a neuron into skin cell. And today, this is possible. And this is done in many experiments today in biology. And this seems really magic, but it is science and technology. That's absolutely fantastic. That's a really lovely explanation of, of where we've come um, uh, with those technologies. So look, I, as you know, I kind of stole the title of your book for the title of this podcast. So tell us about the death of death. Four years ago, I published a book with a fantastic uh, British co-author, David Wood, who chairs London Futures. And uh, um, we wrote this book about how technology would let us live indefinitely young in the future. Uh, and it is not really immortality because no one, no one can guarantee immortality. We never know what might happen tomorrow uh, if there is a comet crashing against our planet or if there is a piano falling on <laughs> our heads. Very true. Or, or, you know, a bus in the street. We never know. But... What we can do is to stop aging. And again, since 2012, we know that aging is flexible and it is reversible. So we, we wrote this book, um, which is now in six languages and coming in six more languages by the end of the year. Um, first in Spanish, because um, I am the co-author in Spain and I have good contacts with the publishing industry here in Spain. And then we published it in, um, in uh, Portuguese, in French, in Russian, in Turkish, in Chinese, in German, and more languages coming up. But in any event, the idea is that uh, we can stop aging, we can reverse aging, and that is the most noble cause for all of humanity. Because what causes more suffering in the world today is aging and death, actually. If we look at all the deaths of all the people in the world today and in the advanced countries, like in Britain, in Europe, in Japan, in the USA, et cetera, et cetera, 90% of the people, I repeat, 90% of the people die of age-related diseases. Basically, cancer, heart trouble, and neurodegenerative diseases. That kills about 90% of the people. So uh, when we put everything else together, 
uh, which is bad. If we combine malaria, AIDS, wars, terrorism, pianos falling on your head, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, add all that up. And it is only 10% of the deaths in England. So 90% of the people in advanced countries die of age-related diseases. And so if we want to produce some meaningful change in humanity in the future, we need to attack the main cause of suffering, which is aging and death. Forget about everything else, which I know is bad. I know wars are horrible. I know climate change is bad and so on and so forth. But what kills people today is aging and death. Well, Jose, that's a really passionate positioning of, uh, of some of the ideas that I know you share in the book. And uh, as an English speaker on behalf of uh, fellow Brits and fellow Americans, when's the book coming out in English? Well, I'm still working on that, uh, to tell you the truth. It's not easy to publish in English because that is the biggest and most competitive market in the world. And um, uh, it will come out because, as I said, it, it's in, in Spanish, Russian, coming out in Chinese, uh, Japanese, German. So English will come out. Uh, I don't know yet, but it will come out. Don't worry. The English speakers will not die either if they read my book. <laughs> that, Jose, that is one of the best promotional lines I think I've ever heard. <laughs> yes, I, that I tell my friends. If you read my book, you will not die. <laughs> well, I'm, I, I count myself among your friends now. Um, Jose, thank you so much for your time. That's been absolutely fascinating today. Well, Steve, it is my pleasure to join you and all your uh, colleagues and uh, followers. And as I like to say to my Trekkie friends, live long and prosper. Live long and prosper, Sir Jose. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you everyone for listening. Do let your friends and colleagues know about the Informing Choices mini pod and there'll be another episode very soon.